Amen. Amen. Well done. Well done. What a great morning of singing. If you have a copy of God's Word, let me invite you to take it out or turn on your device. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, we're continuing our journey through this letter written by the Apostle John to the church. And just as a reminder, John is the, we believe at this point, the last living apostle, the last one to see the resurrected Savior, the last one to write the uh, uh, entries into Scripture. Uh, and he is writing to the church that's been uh, ravished by false teachers and wolves, and they've had crisis of faith, and they're struggling, and they're fragile, and, and so he writes this letter to uh, show them what a real believer looks like, and to encourage them in the faith, and, and today he'll address an issue that, that I believe all Christians face at some point in their life, and that is this idea that, that our heart will wobble, our faith will struggle, we will have doubts and concerns. We will face problems, and we're not sure always what to do with them. When you think about your heart, from a pure biological definition, it is muscles and valves and uh, nerve endings, and it's designed to move blood through your body, uh, and, and it's just a, a biological creation of God uh, that has a function to keep you alive. You're here today because your heart is beating, right? But we often use the phrase or the thought of heart as the center of our consciousness, our morality, our decision, our desires. We, we might say something like uh, when someone has courage, we might say, boy, they got heart, right? We, we mean they have courage and grit. Or, or maybe, maybe you uh, lose a loved one and you're really sad and you might say, my heart is broken. Or maybe, fellas... You remember when you were at your wedding day and you turned around and, and there she was walking down the aisle and your father-in-law has a lake house so your heart fluttered, right? <laughs> you, you remember, right? Your heart fluttered. You're, you were in, I kid, I kid. My wife's out of town. I'm in the clear. Um, <laughs> the idea is, is that you... That you, your heart fluttered. We, we think about our heart as this seed of decision. The problem is, is that our heart is oftentimes terrible. In fact, the world today will give you this advice. Follow your heart. What's your heart telling you? Brothers and sisters, there are a lot of things I can preach on and a lot of wisdom from God's word I can give you, but this one's pretty simple. If your decision making is based on follow your heart, you're in trouble. You're not going to make it. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah, long before Christ knew this, he says in Jeremiah chapter 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We shouldn't listen to our hearts. But oftentimes in the Christian walk, we are trying our best to love Jesus obey his commandments, run from sin, love the church. We're trying to do all of these things, and life doesn't go the way we want it. And before long, our heart can begin to tell us, God doesn't love you. Or you've done something terrible. He must be mad at you. Or you find yourself in a place of struggle, and your heart starts to doubt faith, and, and you start to doubt God's hand, and, you, and you're not sure what to do, and your faith begins to wobble. John, in 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 19 through the end of the chapter, he will address a church whose faith is wobbling, whose heart is wavering. And he will give us in this passage some keys to when we find ourselves in a crisis of faith, in a gloomy season, in a day in where the clouds are rolling in and we're not sure what to do, John will say, here's how you navigate the moments when your heart is telling you something that's not true. And so he will help us here. Look with me in your copy of God's Word. 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 19, and I'll read through the end of the chapter. 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For, whoever, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and, we, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because he keeps his commandments and do what pleases him. 
Verse 28, and this is his commandment that we uh, believe in his name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Verse 24, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Look at that phrase there for just a moment. I'm going to pray, but I just want you to see this phrase. Verse 19, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. Let's pray about that. Father, would you reassure our hearts this morning? Boy, we are a feeble people, Father. We are a needy people. We are a people because of our own mistakes, our own sins, our own flesh, our own temptations. We can feel guilt and shame and sorrow and we can cower away from you and begin to doubt that you love us or that you'd forgive us or that you're with us. Father, because of just the things of this world, because of sickness and sorrow and death and divorce and depression, we can find ourselves wondering, where are you? Why is this not going the way I thought it would? Or, or, or what, do you, what are you doing? And, and we can find ourselves in these fragile moments of faith. And I'm so thankful that, that you're not silent on this issue. That John, the apostle with the pen in his hand, he writes those very words. When our heart condemns us, when we feel fragile, when we're falling apart, he will remind us what to do. God, this morning there may be some here this, that are just hanging on by a thread. And they are in a tough season of life and, and the, the seas just seem to be crashing all around them and they're they lift their hands to you wondering. They weep through the night wondering, what are you doing and where are you? There may be some here, Father, that have walked in and they are guilty in their sin and they are far from you and they are in a, not a crisis of faith but in a crisis of just atheistic, humanistic rebellion. And they need to turn to you. Father, we, we don't know what tomorrow holds but by the truth of your word this morning, we can be reminded that you are with us and that our hearts do not get the final say. God, teach us your truth this morning. Plant it deep in our soul. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let me kind of help you understand what John's doing. Up until this point in John chapter 3, he's been laying out what it looks like to be a real follower of Christ because they've had a crisis in the first century church. There have been false teachers come in and they taught with flattery words and they talked about Jesus and they talked about God and, and the church just took it. They just believed them and, and they got to rise to power and then all of a sudden their teaching began to go sideways. They began to teach things like Jesus wasn't really God in the flesh or he really didn't die and be raised from the dead or sin is not that big a deal because God forgives us and, and all these things that are anti what John had taught them as a witness of Jesus. And so they believed them. Well, then those false teachers leave the church and some of the brothers and sisters in the church go with them. So now you've got this fragile group of first century believers who have watched their friends be led away and they themselves listen for a while and their faith is just teetering on the edge. They're struggling. They were at a crisis moment. They don't know what to do. And add to that the persecution at the time of Christians. So being a faithful follower of Christ came with pitfalls. And this early first century church has a room full of fragile believers. Now, here's what I would say. This church is full of fragile believers. We are all fragile when it comes to our faith in the Lord. We are daily seeking him and following him, but we are also people who are prone to crisis. We are prone to sin. We are prone to guilt. We are prone to being pulled away. And every day we find ourselves having to reassure and recommit our heart to the Lord. So John writes about that. And he says, I, I want to show you that in those moments where your faith is wavering, your heart is wobbly, here's what you do. Here's how you face those days where the storm cloud seems heavy and the light at the end of the tunnel has vanished. And you're not sure if the sunrise will come. Here's what you do. He will give us three truths to anchor when your heart is wavering, number one, remember the facts. Remember the facts. Look at verse 19. By this we shall know. 
I want you to see that phrase because John is doing something here with the language that's pretty interesting. The phrase, by this, looks backwards. He says, by this, and so you have to kind of turn around and read back up into chapter 3. And he says, by these things, you know you're a child of God. And what has he discovered in chapter 3? Well, in chapter 3, he says, those who really know Jesus, love him, believe he's the Savior. They want to obey him and run from sin, and they want to love the church. We find this in verses 17 and 18 there. And so he says, if you know Jesus is the Savior, and you want to obey him and run from sin, and you excuse me, want to love the church, then you can be sure, looking backwards, that you're a child of God. So in those crises of faith where you're saying, I don't know where I am with God, you can turn around and look backwards in your life and ask these questions. Have I come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Is there a moment where I've given my life to Christ? Have I, on top of that, desired, though not perfectly, to obey him and run from sin? And do I have a desire to walk with the people of God? So in those crises of faith, you turn backwards. He says, by this, look backwards. But then notice the phrase, look there. By this, we know. That phrase is looking forward. So just just stay with me for a moment. I'm standing in the midst of a faith crisis. This is not how I thought it was going to go. God's not hearing my prayer. It's not working out. Something is wrong. I'm still struggling with the same sin. The relationship is still on the rocks. The church is still not reaching my needs. Something's not right. This is what he says. First, look backwards. I know I've been saved. I know I desire to obey Christ. I know the church and the people of God are my family. And then he says, Look forward and notice the sentence that he uses there in verse 9. By this we shall know that we are of the truth, and notice this phrase, and reassure our hearts. He says, so then in the midst of the crisis, you look backwards to collect the facts, and you look forwards to tell your heart what the truth is. So, So here's the overarching message he will give us. Your feelings do not change the truth. Your feelings do not dictate the truth. Your feelings do not change the sovereign God who's sitting on the throne. You may feel like he's not listening. You may feel like he's not with you. You may feel like you're not loved or adding up, but however you may feel, your heart, your feelings, your soul have been affected by sin, and sin does not affect the God who's on the throne. So John literally says, when you find yourself in a crisis of faith, look at the facts, not your feelings. Feelings can mess with you. You might feel like sushi from the gas station is a good idea. That's not the facts. Feelings should not be trusted. He says, look at this. We shall know and reassure our hearts. We shall know of the truth of the gospel and believe. But I want you to see verse 20, because verse 20 may be my favorite verse in this whole passage. Look at verse 20. For whenever our heart condemns us, when I'm doubting, when I'm struggling, when I can't see God, listen to what he says. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. John literally says, when you are in your feelings and you are worried, concerned, unclear, doubting, guilt, shame, whatever may cause you to think God is distant, remember this, God is bigger than your heart. God is larger than your feelings. God is on the throne and ruling. And his promises do not change based on your attitude. His promises are anchored to his character. And his character is always good towards his children. So he literally says, reassure your heart with these facts. You may feel like it's going off the rails, but God has never been on the rails to go off the rails because he's over the rails. He's in charge. 
And so John says, let your heart be comforted. This is wonderful news. Because there are days where I feel completely unworthy because of the sin in my life. There are days where I feel completely at a loss because I don't understand what God is doing or where he's going. There are days when I look at a situation and go, boy, I wish he'd have done this different. Did he even hear my prayer? And all of those things are valid feelings. And God is not mad that we feel those things. God is just making sure we understand those feelings don't change the truth. That the truth is, God is on the throne. The truth is that God is in charge. The truth is that God is for us. And notice what he says. Look there at verse 19 again. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. He literally says we, we don't look at our hearts to get confidence in God. We look at God to tell our heart where to find confidence. We don't follow our heart. We follow the facts of the truth of the gospel and tell our heart about the facts. If we followed our heart, we would be in a mess. When your heart is weighed down, when conviction or guilt are in this place, God is literally saying, don't doubt me, run to me. He says, we have a confidence to reassure our heart. This is the story of grace. Grace is that God did for us what we did not deserve because he is good and loving and wonderful. And grace says that when you're in the middle of those crisis moments, you don't run away from God, you run to God. Grace is this picture of telling ourselves, this is where I'm supposed to be. The facts are the gospel. Let, let me tell you the facts of the gospel for just a moment. Let us remind ourselves the facts of the gospel. God in his sovereignty who is good and right and just created the world. He spoke the world into existence. Everything that was not is now is because of God. And God the creator made at the height of his creation man in his own image. Man and woman he made them. And they together were to walk and commune with God and worship God and be the height of his creation. In fact, we were to have a, a, a ruling authority over creation under God's authority. We were his, uh, advers- uh, his advocates. We were his, his, his leaders under his authority. And yet the Bible says that we've sinned. We have broken God's rules and his laws and his goodness and his mercy. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have gone against God the creator. And because of that, we are destined to die in our sin and spend eternity in the wrath of hell where God's righteous judgment is poured out because he is infinitely holy and therefore sin will be infinitely punished because God is good and right and just. And here's the good news of the gospel. There was absolutely nothing I could do or you could do that would move you from this state of death and eternal damnation and yet God by his grace did something for us for in the fullness of time he sent forth his son and Jesus Christ who is God in the flesh took on our form became man and God together lived a perfect life under the law never broke the rules never went against the will of God and yet it pleased God to lay our sins on him and he went to the cross facing the very hell we deserve and the wrath of God was poured out on him and he was buried in a tomb as a dead sinner, but he rose as a living Savior. And he says to us, all who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. And here's the beauty of the gospel. I did nothing but bring sin. He did everything and now I am his son. So when my feelings tell me God's not listening, he doesn't love me, How could he let this happen? When my feelings tell me that, my facts will look to Calvary and say, he does love me, he knows what I need, and he will lead his sheep. John says, remember the facts. This is who we serve. 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul would write it this way. But God's firm foundation stands bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Listen, 
We are sealed on the foundation. But notice, it's not my seal or my foundation. It's the Lord's seal and the Lord's foundation, which means on my worst day when I don't think my prayers are getting above the ceiling and I don't know where God is and I'm struggling in my faith, it does not change the fact he has sealed me and holds me and will deliver me. Brothers and sisters, might I encourage you, Start a morning routine where before your feet hit the floor, you preach the gospel to yourself. Your eyes wake and you say, Lord Jesus, because of your mercy, your grace, your death, and your resurrection, I am a son and a daughter of the king. And today, no matter where I go or what I get into or how I struggle, that fact will not change. Preach the gospel To yourself. John says, remember the fact, the very knowledge of God is what gives us hope. Number two, when you're in a faith crisis and your heart is wavering, remember to pray. Remember to pray. Look at what he says in verse 21. He says in verse 21, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Now, now just think about John's train of thought. You feel like you're away from God. You feel like a cloud's over. You're in a crisis of faith. You don't know what to do. You don't know where he's at. You don't know how he's going to work. And one of the things that can happen is our feelings can tell us God doesn't love you. God's not listening to you. God doesn't care. And we retreat from praying. We retreat from communing with him. We retreat from going to him. So what does he say? He says, no, reassure your heart with the facts and go back on your knees before your father. You don't retreat, you lean in. You don't go backwards, you go forward. In the midst of the faith crisis, you're not gonna find your answer ignoring God, you're gonna find your answer running to God. So he literally says, when you have this confidence, when God reassures your heart with the facts, get on your knees and pray, ask him. He wants you to talk to him. Lay out your feelings. Lay out your problems. Beg him for answers. Ask him for mercy. Ask him to give you confidence and clarity. Walk with him. Why? Because of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can come before him. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. He says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in a time of need. Because of the Lord Jesus, we can draw in. So he says, when when you find yourself, brothers, I know this is elementary, but I have met many Christians who walk with the Lord and then something turns their apple cart upside down and the first thing they do is retreat in their faith. They stop communing with God at church with believers. They stop praying. They go through a hard season and they run from the disciplines of God instead of towards the disciplines of God. And the Father in heaven says, when you're in those moments, that's when you need me most. Run to me. Come to me. And notice what he says. He says, if you ask it, you'll get it. Now let us be clear here. His text says, whatever you ask for, you will get. That is true. And not true. I'm not calling the Bible a liar, so just stay with me for a moment. This is not a prosperity gospel promise. It does not say that you have confidence to go to God and ask for whatever you want. Listen to me now. Confidence to pray does not mean license for him to answer all of your prayers. If God answered all of your prayers, you would be God and he would be a genie in a bottle granting your wishes. I don't want any of you to be God. You don't want me to be God, right? That's not good. We want God to be God, which means God knows what we need. So what John is saying is, when you're in this crisis of faith, you don't know what to do, you don't know where to go, go to the Lord confidently in prayer, and God will give you what you need for this crisis of faith. He will give you the answers, the clarity, the patience, the endurance, the peace. He will sustain you in prayer. You can ask for it, and he will lovingly give it to you. John would say this a little bit later in 1 John chapter 5. Listen to what he writes. He says in 1 John chapter 5, and this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Now notice what John does. John says, if you ask in his will, he's going to give you what you want. Now let's just remember what John's doing. My faith isn't shaken. I'm not sure where God is. I've made a mess of my life. I don't know what's happening, but I remember the facts. I'm saved. I'm a child of the king. God loves me. And God has told me to pray. So the loving father lets his children ask for what they need. And if I really love him, I will ask what he wants to give me. Because he knows what's best for me. And so he literally says, now you have this confidence to pray. Now John is only repeating what our Savior Jesus said. In the Gospel of John, which John wrote earlier in chapter 14, we find these words. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That's praying in the will of God. This is not a quid pro quo, keep the commandments and then ask what you want and you'll get it. Lord, I prayed today, give me my Corvette. That's not how it works, right? I prayed today, right? That's not how it works. What it is, is that he's our loving Father And he knows what we need. And as children, we are under his love. And we come to him and say, Father, you know what I need in this crisis. Give me what I need. He gives us a boldness to pray. The confidence to talk to God does not give us the freedom to demand from God. Just because we have the confidence doesn't mean we demand. Just because we have the freedom to come before us does not give us license to be flippant and ask questions like Santa Claus with a Christmas list. That's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus has changed my life, and I'm in a moment where I'm struggling, and that Jesus that changed my life has all the answers I need for this moment in my struggle. And so therefore, I will pray. I will seek his name. Now, notice with me one thing I want you to see. He says, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask for, we will receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Prayer and obedience are connected. They are connected because we want to follow him, we love him, we want to obey him, and therefore we want to ask for ways in which we can obey him more. John says, when your heart is wobbling, remember the facts, remember to pray, and then third and finally, remember to abide. Abide. John loves this word abide. In fact, in the the first John, he uses the word over 23 times in this short letter. He loves this idea of communing with God. He gets this phrase from Jesus himself in John chapter 15. Jesus talking about the vine and the branches uses this very phrase. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He says, you you abide in Christ, and that's where all your power is. That's where all your ability is. That's where you get through the cloudy days and the stormy nights and the, the days that seem hard or the guilt that seems overwhelming. That's where you find it. You find it in the Lord. So we abide in God. Look there in your text, the last two verses. He says in verse uh, 23, And this is the commandment that you believe in the Son of Jesus Christ and love one another just as he's commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by him, this we know, that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Now, he tells us when our heart wavers to abide in him. Now, what does abide look like? Well, I want you to just notice what he tells us to do. This is what abiding looks like. Number one, abiding means knowing the son. It means knowing the son. Look there, if you will, again at verse 23. And this is his commandment. That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. When you're in a crisis of faith, the one thing you don't want to do is retreat from Jesus. You you don't want to turn from Jesus. And I want you to notice how John puts the gospel in the verse. Look in your Bible. I want to give you a, a lesson here on the gospel in this verse. And I want to show you what the gospel means by just the way he refers to Jesus. First, I want you to see that he calls him the son. This is a reference to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son. So when we hear of Jesus being the son of God, we immediately hear ringing in our ears, grace, grace, marvelous grace. Why? Because God the Father sent his son on this mission. It was by grace that Christ came. It is by grace that Christ took on flesh and died for us. It's not because we deserved it. It's not because we owned it. It's not because we paid for it. It's because God's grace sent him. The gospel is, starts with the heart of the Father and grace. But notice what else it says. Look there in your Bible. Son, Jesus, 
Christ. Now, Jesus is his earthly name. His earthly name reminds us that he took on flesh. His earthly name reminds us that he was born of a woman. His earthly name reminds us that he grew in stature and wisdom. His earthly name reminds us that he learned at his uh, earthly father's table the the craft of carpentry. His name reminds us that he walked, that he went to the temple, that he prayed, that he was around people who struggled. His earthly name reminds us that he saw death, that he saw sorrow, that he saw hurting, that he saw pain. His earthly name reminds us that he came and walked through the experiences that we walk in. His earthly name reminds us that Jesus became one of us. So when you go through that crisis of faith, Jesus saw it firsthand when he walked on this earth. I remember the Jesus who was in the garden praying and sweating blood drops, asking the Father, where is your will and can this change? He understands where we are. But notice the last phrase there, don't miss it. Son Jesus Christ. Christ is the Hebrew, Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word Messiah. It means Savior. It means the promised one from the Old Testament. So literally what John says is, here's how you abide with God. You remember that God sent his son to identify with your struggle, but not just identify with them, to rescue them from them as the Messiah on high. The promise of the Old Testament and the holder of the keys of all of the future. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to save us. And so when you're walking, Walking through a crisis of faith, you just remember Jesus. You abide in Jesus. You sing to Jesus. You read the gospels of Jesus. You pray to Jesus. You look at the cross that Jesus died on. When you're in a crisis of faith, do not retreat from Jesus. Because brothers and sisters, wherever you retreat from, you will not find the other hero because Jesus is the hero. This is abiding means knowing the Son. Number two, abiding means obeying the statutes. John does something here that's really kind of clever. If you look at verse 23, he says, this is the commandment, it's singular, that I give to you that you uh, obey or know, right, the Son, Jesus Christ. But then notice with me, look there in your Bible. He says commandment, singular, but then he gives two things. His grammar is not very good for English class. Listen to what he says. Verse 23. And this is the commandment, singular, that you believe in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ. Okay, there's the commandment. That's the singular. But then he says, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Wait a minute. That's two commandments. Believe in the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. But to John, it's one commandment. And you want to know why? Because when you come to the love of Christ, you come to the family of Christ. You do not come to Christ's family and then get Christ. You come to Christ and are adopted into Christ's family. But if you've come to Christ, you will love the family. If you don't love the family, you don't know Christ. So he literally says it's the same thing. So here's what he's telling us to do. And then he goes on in the next verse. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him. He literally says this. Obeying the Lord, loving one another, is how you get through the storms of life. Brothers and sisters, listen to me, because as a pastor, I see this over and over and over and over. Someone will have a crisis in their life. Their marriage will be in crisis. Their children will be in crisis. Their health will be in crisis. Their finances will be in crisis. And one of the things that happens is they will slowly slink away from the church. They will slowly get disconnected from loving Jesus and loving Jesus' people. And let me just give you this warning. If you're in a crisis of faith and your heart's best advice is skip church, you're listening to the wrong facts. The crisis of faith is gather with the people of God who want to pray with you, walk with you, weep with you, and preach Jesus over you over and over and over and over. Oh, where would we be if it weren't for the body of Christ in the midst of crisis? John says, you want to abide? Then know the Son, obey the statute, and then finally he gives us a third one, commune with the Spirit. Listen to the last verse. It says in the last verse, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. God in you. God is with you. And this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. This 
This is probably the strongest verse in this chapter because here's what he says. He says, listen, I know your faith's fragile. I know you're struggling. I know that prodigal child is making you wonder where God is, or I know that divorce is making you wonder what happened. I know that death came and it, and it caused you to doubt where is God and why is all this pain. I, I know the sickness and the sorrow and the trial and the one thing after another, after another, after another, after another. But here's what he says. He says, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you're walking with God's people, then never forget this. Never, ever forget this. Wherever you find yourself, God is with you. You see, the struggle cannot win because Christ is in me. And greater is he that's in me than anything in this world, than he that is in this world, than whatever the world may throw at me. This may seem like I'll never get through it, but Christ has implanted the Spirit in me, and Christ will lead me, and Lord knows that it might be death that gets me through it, but even death won't stop God from leading me into glory. Your life may not get any better in this world, but the Spirit of God living in you can strengthen you and hold you. And brothers and sisters, one day he will hand in hand walk you into the kingdom. And so John says, when you're in a crisis of faith, don't forget that the living God is inside you. I'm not in a crisis of faith. I'm in a holding pattern with the Spirit holding my hand. I, I, I know I don't understand and I'm weeping I'm with the Lord. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to close with Matthew chapter 11, and I want you to see something that just absolutely blesses me and encourages me. In Matthew chapter 11, the Gospels record for us a, a conversation between John the Baptist and Jesus. It's actually a conversation that John sends his disciples to ask. John the Baptist is not the John who wrote this letter. John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus who himself had a miraculous conception. The angel came on his parents who were, and allowed him to ha be conceived, and, and, and he was born. And, and the Bible says, Jesus says, that, that John the Baptist is the Elijah promised from the Old Testament to be the forerunner for Jesus. So John the Baptist was given the task of being a little bit older than Jesus to go into Israel and preach to Israel, repent, the Savior's coming. Get your life right. Jesus is on the way. And the Bible tells us that John the Baptist was a fiery, faithful, wild man for the kingdom. I mean, he wore like camel hair and ate locusts and lived out in the wild and he would just stand on the rock and preach and we put you people in cushion seats with air conditioning. Don't be complaining. <laughs> and he would preach the gospel, repent, repent, turn from your wicked ways. And the Bible says that they were coming out of Jerusalem by the droves and he was baptizing them in repentance, preparing them for Jesus. And in fact, in John chapter 1, verse 29, the Bible says that when John saw Jesus near the river Jordan, he looked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew Jesus. He loved Jesus. In fact, he's the privileged one who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. He heard the Father's voice in heaven say, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased, and the Spirit descended like a dove. John was there at those moments. And then in Matthew chapter 11, the Bible tells us that John's in prison. He's been preaching the gospel, and it's got him in trouble. The gospel has caused him to be a rascal to the Roman leaders, and they have thrown him in jail. And listen to what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 2. And now John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ. And he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? What? John the Baptist? The locust-eating wild preacher who baptized Israel and touched Jesus? The one who leapt in his mother's womb when Mary's pregnant womb came near him? John the Baptist had a crisis of faith? John the Baptist had a question. 
How, how could John the Baptist have a question? Because he's been preaching the gospel faithfully and it landed him in jail. That ain't exactly how we thought it would go, right? God, I've been faithful. I've tried to do what you tell me to do. And, and man, this game of life has not played out like I thought it would. And what does John do? John sends word to Jesus. You know what John does? He prays. Now, he prays through his disciples' feet, but he prays, right? Hey, y'all go ask Jesus this question. I got a question for God in the flesh. Go ask him. And notice what the Bible says. He says, are you really the Savior? I'm in this chemo treatment. Are you really the Savior? I'm in this marriage counseling. Are you really the Savior? I'm I'm trying my very best to raise my, my children, my grandchildren, and it's hard. Are you really the Savior? Are you really the Savior? Now listen to what Jesus does. Look at your text. Listen to what Jesus does. Verse 4, and Jesus answered him, go and tell John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. You know what Jesus does? Jesus says, go tell John the facts. Go tell him the facts. I know his heart is hurting. I know he's in prison. I know it's not going the way it's going to go. In fact, he'll lose his head not long from here. But you go tell him the facts, that the dead are alive and the blind see and the lame walk, that I am the Savior sent from heaven to rescue. You go tell them and listen to what Jesus does. Verse 6, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowd concerning John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. Behold, those who wear soft clothing are the kings and the houses. But you went to see this wild man is what he's saying. What then did you go and see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will be prepared of the way before you. Listen to verse 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Listen to the love of Jesus. John the Baptist, who in a crisis of faith sends messengers to Jesus to say, please remind me of the truth. And Jesus says, remember the facts. I am the one who brings the dead back to life. And then he says to the crowd, that man is great in the kingdom. Do you know what this means? This means your crisis of faith does not sever you from the love of God. It draws you closer to God. You fall on your knees and you pray and God gets to hug you even more and say, yes, that's my child. I love the brokenhearted who are needy and cry out to me and need me in those desperate moments. Brothers and sisters, don't see your crisis of faith as being wayward from God. See your crisis of faith as a moment to get a bear hug from God. Says, reassure your hearts. God is with you. Let's pray together, Father. Our church is desired to offer hope and build community. And I pray this morning that you were filled with the hope of Christ as you heard God's word proclaimed. I want to personally invite you to come join us at Brushy Creek. Come see what God's doing here. Come be a part of this community of believers. Every Sunday morning, we gather to hear God's word, sing to him, offer handshakes and hot coffee and ways in which we can fellowship together in life's journey. Would you come join us? At the bottom of your screen, you'll find all the information you'll need to connect with us. I would love to meet you someday standing right here in the lobby of our building. I hope you have a great week, and God bless you.